My name is Pat Ryan. Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's new digital startup hub. We have a particularly special guest tonight. We've interviewed a lot of great entrepreneurs, but never one with more successes uh, than Howard Tolman. It's really going to be a great, great chance to hear a lot of stories. I'm going to try and fit all of these stories into the time we have, because if we spent the time we do with everybody else in each company, we would be here till about 1 in the morning. Howard has uh, got so many great stories, so many great experiences, and he's our new CEO here at the CEC in 1871, so we're really glad to have you, Howard. Glad to be here. Great. <clears throat> well, welcome. Thank you. So, Howard, we always like to start these things out by kind of going back to, um, uh, you know, you're, typically, typically ask people what their company does, but you have so many companies, I think we'll get to that. But you just had some exciting news uh, for your most recent endeavor before you came to 1871. Uh, and uh, if you can just kind of share with people the most recent um, success in the which, Howard Tolman. Which one do you want to, which one are you okay, talking about? I, it's a good question. Whatever, where do you want to start, Howard? I don't, I've so, never had this many. Yeah, so I like to think that after about uh, 13 years, we sold our um, automotive uh, business, which was called the Cobalt Group, to ADP for about uh, $400 million. And, you know, divided by 13 years and the hours we spent, it was probably like 40 cents an hour. But, <laughs> but the satisfaction of tell, you know, having told them for 12 years that we were going to eat their lunch and eventually they would be buying the company, uh, that was probably worth a huge amount of money in addition. <laughs> so. That's great. Well, so many great successes. We're so glad. I have to say, I had the privilege of being on the search committee and uh, there were a lot of great people from around the country who applied for the job in 1871. And, Everybody's, of course, unanimous and excited. First choice was Howard. We're so glad you want to do it. So many great things, and we'll get a chance to talk about that towards the end. But take us back to the beginning. Are you a. Uh, so I'm a. I'm a uh, I was born in St. Louis, but I uh, have been in Chicago since I was about 12 or something. Grew up in Highland Park and uh, went to Northwestern, went to Northwestern Law School, uh, and practiced law for about 10 years. So that so was the beginning. Let's talk about this a little bit. We were talking earlier about how. Peter Thiel's a lawyer by training, um, uh, and there's a group of people in the Valley who've done that. It's an interesting, but unexpected to the average person so much about being an engineer. Did you have any um, uh, undergrad? Did you study anything related to engineering? Did you ever have any exposure to well, that? I well, I wasn't an engineer um, as an undergrad. <clears throat> I started at Northwestern in the Technological Institute, and I actually started programming in high school at uh, wow. IIT. Wow. So uh, that was back when we had punch cards and Vogelback, you know, which is the computing center at Northwestern was just getting started. But the, um, uh, so I practiced law for about 10 years and uh, the singly most salient uh, aspect of that was when I went out to start my first business, must have had 10 different venture firms uh, tell me that they didn't invest with lawyers. They, did, <laughs> they, didn't, uh, they didn't fund companies that were run by lawyers. And I said, why? And they said, because uh, lawyers have to always be right, and it's about being right, and uh, investing in businesses and growing entrepreneurial businesses in particular is about winning, which is a completely different thing. Uh, and they also said that you know they thought lawyers had a very low tolerance for being humiliated, embarrassed, and uh, mistaken. And uh, if, you, if you're not really comfortable with that, you're never going to be a successful entrepreneur. So, you, did, you went to tech undergrad. You were a math math right? and econ math major, and, econ. and uh, you go to law school. What do you think you want to do when you're? What made you go to law school? What were you thinking you wanted to do with it? I, I think I probably wanted to be a litigator, which is what I turned out to be. I worked uh, my first year at law school. In the summer, I actually worked with Jim Thompson, who went on to become our governor and the U.S. attorney and a bunch of other things. And we developed a uh, program for the Ford Foundation. So uh, I, early on, I was doing a bunch of other stuff. And frankly, the second and third year of law school, I was the chairman of the board of editors of the Law Review. Wow. So you do a lot of uh, administration. You know, you're basically uh, running a publication at that time. And your classes take a distant second to... Uh, for those you don't understand, the law review is kind of the highest pedigree job. You're, you're supposed to become a judge or a Supreme Court justice or something, not, not an entrepreneur. I became a used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
But you were kind of an entrepreneurial lawyer. You were not the t typical lawyer of any era, let alone the era uh, in which you were a lawyer. Absolutely. Talk about what that was like, how that came about. Well, so it started that um, when I was about to graduate from law school, two of my professors said, we're going to build a firm, and how would you like to come build it for us? And basically, they said, we want to practice. We don't want to do all this stuff. So um, I joined them as opposed to a big, fancy firm or something like that. And I hired about 60 lawyers. Uh, wow. And I had to go buy the law library and do all of this kind of stuff. So early on. Did you uh, enjoy that? No, not really. But uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, but the what I enjoyed was the nature of our practice was really remarkable. The first five years, we did some of the largest class action litigation in the history of, you know, class actions. And uh, we really so were. So take, take, take yeah. us back for a minute, because, you know, of course, today, class actions are a common thing. From our earlier conversations, I know you talked about um, class actions got redefined by what you all were doing at the time. So maybe walk people back in time to sort of why that was an innovation. And well, you know, the, what the, that led I mean, to the most story. interesting part of that was no court had ever tried to figure out how in the world would you handle 50,000 anything. So, you know, the, they were used to having maybe three plaintiffs and two defendants. So and, for those of you who don't know, class yeah. actions are, you may have heard of them, but class actions are essentially a way of consolidating a whole bunch of plaintiffs and a bunch of people who've been hurt by a common problem. And it matters a lot because if you had a small injury, relatively small, you can never afford to hire a lawyer. And so the idea is if you're wronged and you lost $1,000, $5,000, $20,000, your legal fees would be bigger than your settlement, what, what, your, what you'd win. And so class actions were a way of... Aggregating, helping. right. So Aggregating get, large numbers of people. It turned out that one of the most challenging parts of that was simply managing the data, which is really, when I think about 10 years later, starting CCC or ORC or probably two or three of the other businesses that were all about information management, uh, that all came really from those early days as uh, legal all right, practice. All right, so take, take us back to that, because I think you know, one of the things we love that's really great in Founder Stories is getting a chance to kind of look at it from the perspective you had at the time certainly an incredible wisdom from, but think about it at the time. So you go back, you're, you're looking at this thing where you, instead of doing three plaintiffs, you're doing 50,000. Right, right. A whole other set of problems in an era where technology is not nearly as sophisticated. No, there was no technology. So how did you figure out how to do it? What were the challenges that came out of it? What did you learn? Like, Take us back into, because lawyers aren't exactly famous for being technologists. Uh, you know, I think, Again, if you're the person who has to sort of make the trains run on time, so this all fell to me regardless, I, you know. And interestingly enough, at the, even at the earliest stages, uh, most of these class actions, the, the way the class action law developed was that very large firms uh, would, in their area, file the same thing, and then the federal courts would say, well, we're not going to have even 10 of these same things, so they would be consolidated. And so I would generally run the administration of these big things. And I would be on typically a committee, and most of the other people were the senior partners of the biggest law firms in the, in the country. So it was really interesting. I'd say, gee, I think I have a classmate working at your firm. And the guy would say, well, we have 7,000 lawyers working. You know, maybe he's in the mail room. You know, I mean, not exactly like that, but close to that. Um, so they, you know, they didn't want to do this. And one of the things as an entrepreneur that you learn is that eventually if you're willing to do anything and to do everything, people get out of your way and say, great, you know, be my guest. And lo and behold, that's what happened in a lot of this. And uh, we built the systems from scratch. Uh, we had incredible, bizarre uh, situations. Uh, the one that will never, uh, you know, cease to be frightening for me was I had, uh, on the day before Thanksgiving, <clears throat> I had three U.S. Marshals come to my house to put me on a plane to fly to New York because a federal judge had issued a bench warrant for me. Um, what had happened was the following, he was a bachelor, uh, about 70-year-old judge, in charge of the fact that we were about to pay out $180 million to these claimants. We had you know, sent them the printout and the guy took it home to read it. He was going to read 50,000 items to make sure that the numbers were right. 
Well, in those days, you printed this stuff out on these large sheets, and every other line was green, and it helped you sort of read it. Uh, one of the claims was for Walgreens, and it was actually eight digits. Walgreens was going to be paid 10 million something. Okay? But we hadn't provided in laying out the record for that extra space. Oh. So he's reading, and it says Walgreens will be getting zero comma... 800,000, whatever it was, you know, $752. And he thinks $10 million is missing because even though it was in the total, because the total field was right. you know, big enough. So he freaked out and he was, you know, he's going to go to Thanksgiving dinner with his widowed mother. He was a bachelor, I said. And he was going to have me arrested and have a <laughs> hearing on Friday right after Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, and I was going to explain to him what was going on. And he, this was the first time that. Uh, you had this sort of chain of evidence, bizarre situation, and uh, I didn't, e you know, I didn't even know what to say. So, you know, we got all the copies that we had, and we wrote a little one in. We said, Judge, actually, if you add this up, and of course, who was going to add up fifty thousand numbers? So we did. We spent uh, all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday with adding machines, wow. and brought him a box of adding machine tapes and said it actually adds up to the right number. <laughs> so. So I was, uh, I was only bonded out for like you know, eight hours, but on the plane, I was actually in the custody of these marshals. So wow. It was a rather rude awakening to the... Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So you, you do this... Five years. Five years, and then... Um, so, and then, then so then the next thing that, that happened was... So that was five years of everything you could do around class action law. And then the federal rules of civil procedure changed again. Um, and they made it, they took bankruptcy from a tool that was mostly used to repossess refrigerators from poor people. Uh, and they turned it into a tool for people like Chase Manhattan to use in settling multi-billion dollar <laughs> litigation around real estate investments and things like that. Uh, but the law hadn't even been created other than uh, that it was sort of the flip side of a lot of the class action stuff that we did. So we. Uh, moved into that area, and again, it, it, these were all cases of first impression. There wasn't any legal reporting system. There wasn't anything. We were literally taking the decisions of a judge in New York and taking it to Atlanta and then taking it to Dallas, taking it wherever, and saying, this is how this has to be done. We realize there's no book you can look this up in, but we're inventing it as we go. So again, very entrepreneurial. Um, that was part one. Part two was a very interesting lesson, uh, again, in how the world works with big law firms. Uh, Chase Manhattan, uh, Continental Bank, all these giant uh, investment organizations, when they went to town to make these real estate investments in the good times, they partnered with the local bank, the biggest law firm in town, you know, all of the fancy pants people, the biggest, you know, all of that. When everything turned to shit, Basically, Chase was the odd person out. The local law firm wasn't about to offend the local judge. The local bank was not going to offend anybody. The bankruptcy judge had already appointed his brother-in-law as the trustee. They were perfectly happy to you know, put their kids through college. Uh, the law firm was happy to send bills. And my job was to go in, and we literally described this as the roving national asshole job, uh, to say to the judge, we're... We're settling this lawsuit. We're leaving town. If we have to, we'll go above your head. We're not, never going to come back to Storyville, Oklahoma. Uh, but <clears throat> we're prepared to do what it takes. And you know, we, as a result, we ended up sort of blowing up these very comfortable situations where literally the general consul on the case might have been a guy who four times a year went to New York, had a great meal with his buddy who had referred it from Chase's New York law firm. It was very comfortable, but it wasn't getting the job done. So we had to sort of change the rules and be very disruptive, you know, in terms of that whole process. Interesting. So you're essentially what sounds to most people like a contradiction in terms of just an entrepreneurial lawyer at the time. Right. And, and worse, a tech nerd, because I was really interested in the information. So I was really interested in the... Um, the development of uh, and the use of information, and I'll tell you how that arose. When you have 50,000 claims, you don't have 50,000 trials. So we built systems that created standards that let us say to all of these people, we've seen your claim, 
and here's the amount that we are going to pay based on the fact that we've seen another 49,000 claims. If you object, feel free to get on a plane and come to New York, and your due process will permit you to have a hearing. We wish you well, okay? Um, and if you don't object, here's what we'll pay you. And that permitted the large-scale settlement and administration of these kinds of things, which otherwise um, you would never have been able to have this kind of process. So you were a very early big data guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, that, and in fact, that led to CCC in, in many, many respects. So let's, let's talk about that. But before I do, just remember, you can see up there how to ask questions, but also vote on the questions, because when we get to them, I start with those that are high. So please do, so your voice can be a part of the conversation. But so you're a lawyer. You're running this law firm. You're doing all these interesting things. You're very into systems and, and what you're doing um, and data. How do you get into the auto insurance technology business? So uh, some guys uh, came to me and said, "We the insurance industry is broken in all kinds of ways. But one of the ways it's broken is that in the settlement process, they use this old book that's been around for 75 years, and it tells them what they should pay if your car were lost or stolen, the red book or the blue book or NADA. Um, and that's a horrible system because it came out like uh, eight times a year and it was grossly inaccurate. It was just somebody's you know, wild ass guess. Um, and that's how they had been settling claims. Uh, and the alternative was if you could find a comparable vehicle that was like the car that was lost, you could use that price as the way that you constructed the settlement with the claimant. Or you could say to them, take the car. If you, if you lost a car that was two years old and had 10,000 miles on it, and it was a Buick Riviera, we'll find you a replacement Buick Riviera, and that's how we'll settle your claim. And they said they wanted to organize that to scale, right? Right at the point, even though there were tens of thousands of these claims, it was a mom and pop thing where individual dealers would sometimes work with brokers and frankly, the brokers were getting some money under the table, and you know everybody was uh, working out because the book was. So was it basically kind of a marketplace? Well, the book was so far off the off the market that there was the ability to get uh, bribes, fraud, everything else, and still save the insurance companies money by finding these replacement vehicles and doing the dealers a favor of selling cars for them. So okay, it was so a marketplace. It was an auction marketplace. So you've got this gr interesting idea. Right. Um, and as we know, no plan survives first contact with reality. So talk about what this, this, this really interesting idea way before its time on a lot of levels. I mean, ideas like this came in the early 2000s and seemed innovative. Yeah. So you're going to do this. You come out there. And what works and what doesn't? Well, first of all, let me tell you, the, the singly most important thing that I say to all entrepreneurs came from this particular juncture. And that was that the guys who were raising the money said to me, we're going to raise 750000 bucks." And I said, that's great. And they said, we want you to go to the bank and borrow $100,000 because you'll have some skin in the game. And I said, you have to be shitting me. You know, I, first of all, I wasn't going to do that. Second of all, I'm leaving this very lucrative law practice. I'm taking the risk on the venture. I'm going to work for virtually nothing. I think that's enough skin in the game. I don't have to be the banker, too. And this is something that occurs every single day right now for entrepreneurs all the time. They're like, well, what are you investing? And it's a, it's a perfect answer to say my time, my opportunity cost, all these things. If you want to go and find a banker, go find a banker. You know, your, your entrepreneur, your CEO doesn't have to also be the uh, source of the financing. And uh, uh, so that was a big thing because what I said was, I'll leave the day after you raise the 750, but not before, because I'm sacri you know, making a lot of uh, choices and sacrifices. So you raise the money, you come back to me when you're ready to go. And uh, we got over this skin in the game thing, but it was a huge and very important thing to be able to stand up and say, I'm just not doing that. I didn't think I had to mortgage my future in addition to everything else right. to start the business. It's good advice, good advice. So, you're, so you start out and, uh, Talk a little bit about the things that work. Like, what are the things that you got out there and you're like, boy, we nailed it? And what are the things you look at and go, eh, we had to make some adjustments? Well, look, I, you know, I break the world down into what people tell you are their express needs, 
and what are their real needs. Mm -hmm. And the express needs were, uh, we want to be fair, we want to, you know, use computers because computers are cool things, you know, we want to be accurate, all that stuff. The real needs were the insurance adjusters couldn't do these calculations. Uh, there was a bunch of fraud. Uh, they had bad information. So at what know. point did you move from understanding the perceived needs to the real needs? Well, you know, if you're lucky, you find some people who are on the industry side who say, look, I understand what our public, you know, facing thing is. We can't admit that we have a big fraud problem. We can't admit that our insurance adjusters can't do math. But if you had a computer that eliminated the fraud and could do the math right every time, that would be a big deal. And so there were actually some so pretty first, smart so, so guys. First, so yeah. the first couple of months you're out there, you're trying to make this work, you're figuring it out. Look, well, look remember, at that, remember that the first version of this, which was completely wrong, was this auction marketplace where if a two-year-old Buick Riviera was missing, we would publish that to all the dealers who were in our network and wait for offers to come back, and those offers would establish a market price. And the insurance company could say you could have any of these cars. The prices sort of coalesced around, uh, you know, twenty-two hundred dollars, or you could have twenty-two hundred dollars. It turned out a beautifully clean idea. If it were yeah. whiteboards back then, you'd say right. it's the perfect whiteboard idea. Yeah, and you know we had TTY forty-threes, which were these big fat, you know, fax machines, and we built this whole network. And the dealers never responded. Never responded. Not and when ever. you started it, did, yeah. did, was it conceivable? It was like, all right, those dealers. Was that on the list of things? No, it wasn't on the list of things because how much you know easier could your life be if you're a car dealer and somebody says, this schmo lost his car, here's a check to replace his car, and we're sending him to your dealership. It's like, OK, maybe you should put down the Sun-Times, you moron, and sell this guy a car, <laughs> right? There's no financing risk. There's no, you know, it was like, what, what are we doing wrong? Um, it turned out they were just that lazy. So this is one of the interesting things, I think. This is one of the really interesting things, which is the question of product market fit. When you try and figure out product market fit, one of the challenges is you can't, you can't expect the world to be the way you would be if you were them. And I think that's, that's one of the interesting ones is why we have so many pivots out there is people have these wonderful whiteboard ideas that make a ton of sense. And if the entire market were you, clones of us, it would work great. Sure. But real people live in the real world, and they have different influences on how they behave. So in your case, you get out there, your perfect idea isn't working. You got crickets coming back. Right. So what do you do? So we had to do their job for them, which has been a rule in every business ever since. It was a rule in the law thing. It was like, you're a big, fancy senior partner. You're not going to worry about you know the judge's printout. So get out of our way and let us do it. So uh, what's that mean in this context? It means we had to go out and inventory all these dealers, put them into the database, and we had to do the matchmaking. So you sent people out to all these lots. Right. You wrote down what was on there. Right. Really exciting in the middle of winter. Let me, <laughs> let me, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Scraping the ice off to Absolutely. see what the sticker says. Absolutely. Uh, and so you go there, very glamorous, by the way. It gives you a sense of how glamorous by the way, entrepreneurship they is. didn't have stickers because these were used cars. Okay. So you couldn't even rely on the sticker. Well, okay. So what do you look for, like, yeah. the, the... You had to look through the window to see if it was AM, FM, stereo, and maybe these are power seats, maybe they're not, all this kind of stuff, because all of that impacted the value. So you write it down, you come back. So this this had to be some tough times. Yeah, yeah. It was. We, I was out there. I mean, we were out there demonstrating that you could actually do this, and building up the data because if you didn't have the data, you're you, creating you data. Yeah, totally, totally. A new kind of data, which was a real time inventory database across the United States of what used vehicles are selling for. It's, by the way, it's a great example of we say in our company sometimes. You know, uh, guys say the ball's in his court. It's like, well, jump over the net, go get it, and bring it. No, that's jumping, going yeah, to get it. It's the worse than that. It's that the customer knows he has a problem. There are no customer problems. <laughs> <laughs> They're all your problems. Okay. So when the customer says, we understand it's our problem, you know, forget it, right? Because that means that you've created a problem for him. It doesn't mean you're a solution. And so we had to go do that, put it into the system. So you're doing that. Yeah. Then what happens? So that meant we had the data, so that was part one, uh, but we didn't have a, we didn't understand another pain point uh, until we, you know, had, and believe me, we, this business 
would not have succeeded but for a few people in the insurance industry that were forward looking, you know, which is a complete oxymoron. Um, and, uh, but a few of those people said, what our real problem is, is that when the insurance regulators come in, if we have a mistake in the file, they fine us. And that's all they come in for is a gotcha game. Uh, and they love to look through the file and see that there was a typo or the math wasn't right. Or it could be $5, they'll fine us $50,000 because that's how they justify their existence. You know? um, so we said, well, look, you know, if every one of these files had one of our printouts in it, then you'd be in pretty good shape. And they said, sure, that would be fabulous, but why do you think that the insurance industry uh, and these regulators uh, would give you know, two shits about your piece of paper? So talk about doing it the hard way. So first, you gotta, you, you gotta plan to get the data, doesn't work. So you got to do it the hardest way possible. Then you start to get to find some early adopters, some real innovators, and they give you some good opportunity. But you got a regulatory problem. Sure. Is this in sure. Illinois? Yeah. So you got to go deal with our famously forward-looking regulator. Dale Washburn was his name. He was the director of insurance, um, and so we went to him, and we said, "This you, is tenacity." How many people would have given up at one right, right. of these giant mountains? Yet? So we went to this guy and we said, you don't know us from Adam, but you have to regulate us. We figured he's a regulator, right? This is the one thing that, that they, would, they would do. Right. No, it doesn't happen a lot. He said, who are you? That was part one. And then we said, well, you don't know us, but we're working with all the insurance companies and you regulate them, you know, like crazy. So you ought to regulate, regulate us too. And he said, I don't, you know, we don't even know what you're asking, but sure, we'll regulate you too. And I said, would you mind writing us a letter that says we're regulated? And could you put in a line that says, you know, <laughs> you're not endorsing us or anything, but if the insurance companies use this system and it's in the file, then you won't say that they violated this particular rule. It could be, you know, anything else. Uh, they said, yeah, we, get, we guess we'll, we'll put it in a lot of disclaimer language, but we'll write you that letter. And so that letter, uh, you know, a smooth which, talker. Yeah, that letter which we got uh, from about 48 insurance commissioners nationwide. Eventually, the senior claims people at these insurance companies would laminate and put under their pillow at night because <laughs> they slept so well. Because we completely eliminated this whole gotcha thing; they were never fined again. It was unbelievable. It's like, oh no, here's the here's the printout, and here's the letter right next to it. And it became a complete monopoly, a total barrier to entry. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing was these guys didn't even know what a database was, much less that we were you know, managing this information and everything else. So we, f we figured we would test that out by shipping them the database, uh, which we offered to do because that would be part of regulating us. And so we would send down literally what used to be 500, you know, ream pieces of, you know, we'd send down 50 boxes. This would, in each state, we would only have to do this one time. <laughs> and the guy would say, don't call us, we'll call you when we want to review the 50 boxes worth of paper that is the physical output of the database. Uh, so that, we got over that really quickly. And then when competitors came in, which was years later, people would, came in and said, we don't need to do real inventory. We can use newspaper ads. We can use a Ouija board, you know, all this stuff. Um, the Department of Insurance across the board in every single state said, forget it. We're not going to, you know, have 14 other methodologies. We're happy with these guys. And this is the way we're telling the insurance companies they can do it. Wow. And so 40 years later, it's still, still the primary way that insurance losses are settled in the United States. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. So this is an interesting one. You know, we talk a lot at Founder Stories about founder market fit. And in my first company, um, I didn't have a good founder. I had a whiteboard strategy. It was a good one. And uh, for another time, it's, you know, it was uh, painful to, to learn the hard way that uh, everything that made sense on the whiteboard didn't, wasn't the way that our customers worked. And I think one of the interesting things is, there are two interesting things. One is pushing the market is a really interesting one. Um, you know, Matt Maloney and uh, Mike Evans from Grubhub talked about, up on the stage about, uh, in their case, and the way they, you know, restaurants aren't sure. exactly famous for doing this. Of course you want orders, but what did they do when they started? 
they went out and grabbed one of their bikes menus. and they grabbed menus, menus. and they yeah. loaded the menus in. It's the same model as us going out and doing the inventory. You can't, you know, you have to do the work for your customers. Uh, and the other thing I'll tell you, uh, and this was a big part too, I call this sort of the second sale, but it's, it's not even that hard to sometimes sell your new business or product or service into a company. It's a year later when you're not in the room and maybe you have an advocate in the room and here's some financial guy saying, I wonder if we should renew this service. And if you don't have not only an advocate in the room, but have provided that person with justification and ammunition and everything else, it's just too easy to say no. It's just right. too easy to say, no, we don't need that service. Right. So you have to anticipate the second sale, which is really how you lock these things in. And if you don't do that, you would discover that you know things will be going along, going along. And you know we used to say that renewals are just business and terminations are personal. Right? <laughs> it's like you hate me, you want my family to starve, I hate you. You know. So to prevent those, you really have to be uh, anticipatory. And it's not always easy because you're. You don't know when that's going to occur, among other things. And your user yeah. may not be your decision maker; they may yeah. be an influencer. Sure. No, it's a lot of. The other thing we talk about founder market fit is this question of a lot of founders learn the hard way that they don't really understand the market from the inside out. So you got to learn the market from the inside out here. Um, one of the things that'd be interesting is, you know, did that influence later startups how you approach the beginning? Did you approach them any differently? You know, we well, the one thing that was very clear was when ten of your customers control eighty percent of your market, you want to find more businesses and more markets like that. And that's, that, that's really been a central part of everything we do. We look for oligopolistic markets where a few yeses are the whole game, where everybody else eventually has to be part of that system, where you can be sort of the hub and the central system, the industry standards, or that you can set all the metrics. Uh, and the very nature of uh, the consolidation adds additional benefits. Like each of these insurance companies really could tell internally if a claim had been submitted three times to them, but couldn't tell whether it had also been submitted to another insurance company. We, we made, I mean, we built models of fake cars and we, we set up the world's largest boogeyman about multiple claims and said the only people who can protect you against this are us, because we're working with everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had, we provided horizontal products to these vertical markets that were solutions that no one else could provide, including them. Including Interesting. Them. So one of the things that happens in a slow adopting market, I mean, you've got automobile dealers and insurance companies, not exactly the leading edge of adoption. Um, so when you're building a company, you've got mouths to feed, you've got payroll. Um, you know, one of the great lines in entrepreneurial say is that if, if you don't respect someone, that guy's never had to make payroll. And so you've got to make payroll, you've got to make this work, you're trying to grow the business. Um, but you're in a slow adopting market. So how did you deal with the fact, both from an employee perspective, a market perspective, and a funding perspective, of keeping everything going and keeping the momentum going? Because generally speaking, from my experience in these slow adopting markets is, they eventually get there, but you're, you're, you're a thin part of the curve. It's a lot further out. Sure. So, so, so CCC, so how did you yeah, do it? So, well, first of all, I, so I say that about every business, which is it's going to take about two or three times longer than you expected from a time standpoint. And whatever you have in your plan, it's gonna cost two or three times more. Mm -hmm. uh, so CCC was exactly that. Uh, we underperformed the plan for about two years, two and a half years, and then we blew it away. I mean, it was literally, uh, because the nature of this thing was, if State Farm and all states say yes, then it's the world's greatest home run. And if they don't, you know, you have to wait it out. Uh, so there's two ways to win, and I hate to say this in front of this crowd because you know I've been quoted a thousand times saying uh, in the last week, saying we're not we're tired of keeping score based on what you raised. We'd like to keep score in terms of what your revenues are. Having said that, the way we stayed alive was we were the greatest storytellers in the world, <laughs> and we kept raising more money at higher valuations. And so literally before we even had uh, a substantial you know market penetration we went public. And in each level of uh, that uh, funding from you know, friends and family to seed to venture to the IPO, 
Um, every one was a quantum leap in valuation in a very short period of time, in less than three years. Wow. So uh, it went from basically, we went public in 1983. We started in 1981 wow. and sold it in 1987 for about $100 million when that was actually a meaningful number. It was a meaningful uh, and it And the way we stayed alive was because we were able to raise, now, I don't think you would have been able to raise that kind of money if directionally you weren't with these guys and if you couldn't make a pretty convincing case that in fact you were going to get there, it was just a question of time. And, I t and by the way, I tell a lot of companies that we're invested in now that the success trough is a lot more costly and deeper than the, oh yeah, well, someday we'll get there trough. So when you raise money and you think it's a short you know, stretch, if things go super well, it's going to cost you 10 times more money. And you, know, you need to figure out a methodology to deal with that. All right, that's a great point. So one of the challenges with some with so many successes, like Howard, you can see all those companies up there. We had to put small logos because he has so many. Um, so we're just going to be able to go to a couple tonight. Okay. Um, we'll do part two later, I guess. But, all right. Um, so let's talk about Cobalt, another great success. One you talked about at the, the top of the hour. What? How? how Where did that come from? How did that come about? So Cobalt was uh, a situation where we. We were very early into every kind of aggregation. So we were probably the first uh, job database. Uh, we were probably the first boat database, car database, uh, real estate database. And uh, Cobalt was, we kept boats.com for a long time and we still have usedcars.com, but Cobalt was our car solution for being uh, a you know huge database of vehicle information, completely unrelated, interestingly enough, to the six thousand or seven thousand dealers that we had in CCC. Uh, but Cobalt was a different situation. I knew this goes back to being like ten years old, I guess, when I sold shoes. Um, I knew that in the very very old distant past, when there were newspapers, uh, that. The car guys, every guy, every big product manufacturer would create some beautiful piece of art and then ship it around to hundreds of stores and say, use this art. You're, you can't afford to make this beautiful picture of a Florsheim shoe or something, but you can put your store name and you know your address and stuff on this thing and then give it to the newspaper, newspaper, newspaper template. Newspaper. Absolutely. So I knew that uh, Ford and GM uh, we're going to hire the biggest ad agencies in the world when the web came along, okay? At, you know, the web came along. We were in five or six different businesses at the time, uh, all anticipating the web. But uh, I knew that they were going to hire these big, fancy agencies. I also knew that no one wanted to work with the 15,000 individual GM dealers. No one, okay? Because you had Bob Rohrman, you know, with a chicken head and you know, all, the, all these kinds of things. So, uh, so they could make you crazy in the head. We figured that, all right, so you'll take your style guidance from the big fancy agencies. And then what we did is build templates for every manufacturer, for every customer. And we ended up doing about uh, 16,000 dealers. And at that time, there were maybe 21,000 uh, in, the, in the whole United States, uh, running their e-commerce website business in this mass customization, template-based fashion. And that's a model that we, even today, we're in looking at new businesses to do the same thing, to say, you can now create tens of millions of individual responses that look personalized, feel personalized, have personal information, and are done completely automated fashion. So, um, so that's how Cobalt started. Here again, uh, we, thought that the dealers were, we give them we built an enormous set of tools and this is what you said before about you build these tool sets and you expect these people to use them we should have learned this from the car dealers or the insurance adjusters but we didn't we figured out right, here you press these three buttons and you can change the price on a sale or, and they were like no we don't want to do that so we developed eCare which was all right if you want us to hold your hand and do everything for you it's an upcharge and it became the largest part of the business, doing it for them. Uh, and so we were a very large uh, operation that ran the dealers' websites all across the country. Again, very significant. 
The manufacturers, for a variety of reasons, have very little control over individual dealers for a lot of state regulatory reasons. We controlled so many of the dealers' websites that if they wanted us to have a sale, if they wanted to have a special promotion, if they wanted to have uh, some special stuff, we could implement that in ways that GM could never do. Interesting. So we were able to control the pipe. So talk, talk I'll a little I'll tell you just one last yeah. thing about that. When you're controlling all these things, again, in these vertical markets, but the management structure in the industry changes as it did. It changed from uh, dinosaur dealers. These were the first generation of guys who owned a baseball team and a car team and then a car deal chain of car dealerships to their sons um, who were mostly in the real estate business and then to professional managers. The professional managers, the first thing they said is, you're stupid to be single threaded in only GM cars. Let's get some Toyota dealerships. Let's get Lexus, let's get a couple of other things. As soon as that happened, you had another one of these things where the provider of horizontal apples to apples management reports, which we were the only people that could do, was way more valuable than just the report that you would get from GM because you couldn't compensate right. your management in any consistent fashion. So we built another one of these unique systems that made it work for the this is a model. This was Cobalt, right. So, so talk, this is an interesting one because you had a great start with Cobalt because it was really at the early part of the uh, dot-com boom. But as I remember it... Um, it took 13 years. Yeah, it took, it, <laughs> the story didn't end in 1999. Right, right, right. So talk about some of the ups and downs and how you navigated. There was a time I think you all took it, it was public and then private. Sure, talk sure. Talk about that experience if you would. Well, I, th I think that the... Um, you know, I think the first three or four years of the, the web... The overnight excess, yeah, success in 13 years? Right. The first three or four years of the web, I mean, dealers were still completely superstitious. They were still running newspaper ads with the same, you know, bait and switch, you know, cars. that you'd go there and, gee, we sold that two minutes ago, you know. Um, and they, you know, that was how they had lived their whole life. I mean, so they would literally, you would talk to a dealer and he'd say, I have to spend $20,000 a month or I won't make my requisite number of sales. And you'd say, well, what are you gonna spend it on? He, he would say, I don't know, and it doesn't really matter. I just have to spend that money. So we said, eventually, you know, spend it with us. We can help you uh, do it. But it literally was four or five years where the dealers, first of all, it was exactly the same as CCC. The internet was another way of feeding a staggering amount of leads to these guys, and guess what? There was nobody there. You know, the lead would come in, and you would say, you have to invest in a person. You have to have an internet specialist. That took three years just to get the dealers to add a person who was the other side of these, this lead flow. It's amazing because, uh, you know. for those you don't know, you know, the salesmen get paid in a car dealership only if they sell something. Absolutely. So it's amazing to think that somebody wouldn't be there saying, licking their chops. No, this was one of the most discouraging thing, and I don't know whether they thought it was that people weren't serious or that they uh, weren't, you know, sincere or that they, until they showed up physically, it didn't mean anything. Uh, and there were a lot of laws that you couldn't, you know, if you could have completely sold a car on the internet, which is a service we're working on right now, um, if you could have done that, it might have changed. But it took literally four years at least. And you're right, you know, I, I used to go into dealerships. My favorite dealership had the names of every salesman on this beautiful board with magnetic letters, and each day you didn't sell a car, they took one letter off your name. <laughs> and so unless your name was like Higginbotham or something, <laughs> uh, you were you were gonna be toast if you weren't selling some cars. That was a pretty, but that's how it is. And at ADP, uh, every Tuesday you stand up and you report on your sales, and you're humiliated in front of the whole rest of the group if you don't have a good report. That's sales, sales is tough. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. All right. Um, all right, interesting. So talk a little bit about Tunes, because this is another of the many interesting companies you've done. So Tunes uh, was a whole bunch of uh, screw-ups. Tunes was really my one of the worst adventures and best adventures of my life. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, some of the guys who are now working with us at Music Dealers and elsewhere, uh, which is a current Chicago company, worked for me at Tunes and have come back because they're specialists and experts with uh, digital music and uh, all of this stuff. So again, 30 years later, 20 years later, whatever, it's amazing 
how lucky we've been to keep a lot of these folks engaged in these businesses. But Tune started when Microsoft and Intel came to me and said, uh, you know, what can we do on the web to drive computer sales? And I said, music, you know, would be what I would suggest. And they said, okay, here's a bunch of money, you know, which doesn't always happen. Uh, go, see, this, you have to be pretty successful to have right. Microsoft and Intel yeah. show up and give you money. Yeah, well, they were, remember what was going on at the time. They had these stupid processors. They would keep introducing new ones. No human being could tell the difference, you know, between the processing power, but they wanted stories to tell. So one of the stories was very much around music and stuff. So I partnered with uh, Jam Productions, and our thought was that every band that mattered in the world would come through Chicago. Uh, we would wire a few venues, and every band would come through, and we would do a webcast, and that was our business. The fact that the webcast looked like Godzilla over the web, the 28.8 modem, if you had that, you know, that was, we knew directionally we were in the right place. Uh, and it was, uh, it was horrible in so many ways. So, so one way was, all right, so the jam guys, my job is all the technology, the money, everything else. You guys go line up the talent. So I figured, you know, that's their business. I didn't realize, talk about an industry thing, I didn't realize that the people that the music performers hate more than anyone in the entire world other than their bandmates um, are the promoters, you know, because the promoters are constantly trying to screw them out of their guarantees. So Jerry Michelson, wonderful, you know, guy, everything else. Jerry, go talk to the bands, get them to sign off on this stuff. And they, they were like, you know, we hate Jerry Michelson, you know. So I'm like, okay, well, that's not good. That's not good. So then we sent him to go deal with the labels. And he knew all the senior people at all the labels. Those weren't the people that were dealing with the Internet. So the people with the, dealing with the internet were at raves in the middle of the night doing $5,000 ad buys to try and bring music to the web. Uh, and this led to the famous you know, quote about, you know, don't set, send a man to do a boy's job. You know, this was like <laughs> talking to Tommy Mottola was not going to help because Tommy Mottola can't type, much less know what the internet was all about. He was just the head of Sony. You know, someone in the trenches was actually the person we needed to be talking to. So we started, and we did it for a year and a half or two years, and nothing happened. I mean, we, and we did some very clever things, but basically what, what emerged was that the real content was not the webcast. The real content was uh, digital music and all of the information associated with that. So I went to uh, Jan Wenner. Uh, who was the publisher at the time of Rolling Stone. I went to the family that owned Downbeat Jazz, went to a guy named David Mays, who was the king of hip hop. He uh, published The Source. And I said to each of them, uh, here's the deal. I have all this money and I'm gonna go public and I'm gonna raise a lot of money. You're still writing your own checks, trying to figure out what you're gonna do with your content on the web. Why don't you partner with me? Give me all your content. I'll exploit it on the web. I'll build." all these websites for you, uh, and I'll just pay you a bunch of money, and then you won't have to write your own checks, and you'll just get money all the time. And to this day, Jan Wenner sends me wonderful presents on my birthday saying, thank God I listened to you because I would have lost millions of dollars thinking that you know, anybody, any single person, you know, could compete in this crazy market uh, for music. So that's what we did. So, we, so that, goal, that trick was to get all the publishers who mattered to work with us, um, and we then became the principal provider of music information, and everybody eventually had to come to us. You know, and what was interesting about that was the hubris, uh, AOL, we'll, we're gonna do our own, you know, you'll be back, uh, because you, know, you think it's easy to construct 30 years of reviews, photographs, album, you know, nobody can do that. So to this day, I mean, all of them pay us really substantial license fees. And RollingStone.com is still up there. All these things are still up there. That's great. Yeah. So there's so many things we can talk about, so many lessons learned. Um, but I want to go to some of the questions from okay. the crowd here. Um, so what do you, Howard Tolman, look for as a sign of promise in first-time entrepreneurs? So I would say work ethic and passion. I think we know that the ideas are going to morph and change, 
But if you're not passionate about it and if you're not willing to work like 80 hours a week to make your dream real, then you know uh, we can find somebody else who wants to do that. Any other things you look as a tell or red flags besides the? Uh, you know, I, I think that honestly, um, you know, hard work eventually wins over just about everything, including you know native brilliance and fabulous ideas and stuff. So. I have to tell you that we don't, we always say, we may not outsmart everybody, but we will outwork them. And that's our, that's our process. So I don't have to look much beyond that. And I think uh, over the years, uh, we, can, we can identify very cl you know, clearly and quickly whether somebody has that kind of work ethic and that kind of commitment. And everything else, you can sort of supplement, you can train people to do things, uh, but you can't train them to care. Great. So a couple of questions kind of clustered together here around um, around the idea of Chicago and Chicago for startups and sort of the two questions here kind of thinking about Chicago as a place to start a company versus the coast or what makes our entrepreneurial scene different here. How would you uh, um, how would you respond to Chicago given your exposure? Because you, you started a number of companies in Seattle, right? I did, but you know you have to understand that my the Seattle companies were funded by Warburg Pincus, which was my partner in, in CCC, oh, along okay. with Golder Toma. So, Stan Golder and uh, Warburg Pincus were our first investors in CCC, and uh, when we decided to go back into the space with Cobalt, Warburg was our first call, and they were like, "Just tell us where you know where to send the money." Um, so look, I think I couldn't be more excited about Chicago. I think both of the coasts suck, uh, and I think I think for three reasons: one, hyper competitive. I think uh, hyper competitive both in terms of competing for talent, um, expensive to live, you know, uh, competition in terms of all those kinds of things. Uh, so that's that's number one. Number two, I think that uh, out there there's a thousand people trying to do everything. But each of the coasts are, uh, you know, not single-threaded, but limited in terms of what's going on. I had this debate with uh, Louis Lazar about, well, if you were a fashion company or a media company or something like that, you'd have to go to New York. And I'm like, well, maybe you don't know about Morningstar, and maybe you don't know about Comscore, and you know, maybe you don't know about a few of the companies that are right here in Chicago. Um, but I don't think you have to go anywhere else. Uh, and then I think the thing that we're really saying here about 1871 and about the whole city is, and Jim O'Connor said this, this is this, you know, Chicagoness. I mean, I think, you know, by and large, this is a place that's not zero sum. I think people are actually willing to help other people be successful. I think on the coasts, it's not even enough to win. It's that your friends have to fuck up. You know, it's like horrible, but it's, that you know, it's it's a very different, very hyper competitive uh, environment. Here, I think uh, it's a big pie. We have a lot of different industries, a lot of companies. They're all going to need technical enablement. They're all going to need digital solutions. Uh, huge pie, huge opportunity, great place to live. Uh, all the costs seem to pretty much be under control. I, so I don't really think there's a better place you could be right now to start a company. Great. So um, there's a few more around that. So let, let me take it. There are a number of questions, and people want to hear about you know your role here at 1871. Um, first question, which I've heard you answer, but I'd love to have you share with everybody. That's our number, number one vote getter right now. <laughs> okay. Is what is the main reason you decided to become the CEO here? So I think 1871 is uh, one of the most important things. Uh, that Chicago can, you know, be focused on right now. And, you know, we're, we've become uh, an attraction, we've become a place. And, you know, I, I really feel, because I believe that, you know, uh, everything in the world is an iterative process, that if we stopped, if we rested on our laurels, if we said, boy, aren't we great, and didn't continue to grow and add facilities and resources and, new businesses and all kinds of other uh, assets and things like that, that uh, we would lose our primacy and we wouldn't be a special place. And I think 1871 is a completely special place and we want to build off of everything that's come to date. 
and make it like 10 times greater. And that doesn't diminish in anything, in any respect, what's gone before. It's just that if you don't think things can get better, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur for another reason. And, you know, look, I, my own life, you know, we always say it's not about luxury, it's not about big cars, it's not about money, it's about getting up every day and saying, shit, I get to go do something I'm really enthusiastic about. And by the way, I haven't started here. So the fact that I've been here every day is probably I, just I my sickness, just my sickness. But I will start here in January. Um, and talk about your vision. What kind of innovative ideas do you want to? So, uh, you know, I, this has been, I mean, I think this has, you know, been well written about. But I mean, we want to uh, continue to expand the uh, tools that we have here to enable our companies to be successful. We want to have. You know, I've talked about uh, video studio to create videos for the companies, uh, videos about the companies, videos about 1871, uh, webcast, broadcast, all kinds of different things. So we've talked to, uh, you know, WTTW. We've talked to a lot of people about that. Uh, we've talked about uh, Indiegogo. I mean, we're minutes away from the SEC getting out of our way once and for all so that crowd sourcing will now be a source of crowdfunding. So equity for small businesses will be raised, you know, from the masses. <clears throat> and Indiegogo is the principal company in the world that's going to do that. Kickstarter basically said, we don't want to do that. So we've already arranged for Indiegogo to open an office here. And these guys are scientists. I mean, they have, they've done about 100,000 of these campaigns. But they can tell you about halfway into the campaign whether your perks are right, whether your video is right, whether your campaign is going to succeed or not. And they're going to be here coaching our, our companies to do that. And this is a whole other channel. It's amazing. I mean, this isn't uh, Series A or C. This is the whole world will be available to our companies to obtain financing, and they'll have the best coaches in the world to do that. So that's, that was another one. Um, you know, we've talked about some international things with uh, London, where we spent some time not so long ago, Israel, where I'm headed in a week, uh, Brazil. Um, you know, Brazil has 60 million people on Facebook. Uh, these markets are exploding. You know, if you want to be a, a player, you know, some of these places that seem remote are actually very fertile, uh, great opportunities. Uh, 3D prototyping, I, you know, I'd love to see some more companies here that were about products, and, and I think we do a lot of 3D printing um, at our offices already, and I think that uh, Zach Kaplan, you know, Inventables is probably the state of the art in the country. Uh, we'd like to have a lab, you know, here to do that. Um, we'd like to figure out how people don't have to leave when they get to a certain size. So we're talking about building some suites that would accommodate uh, the next stage of growth for some of our companies so they can still have access to all the resources. Uh, but not go out somewhere and just be sort of the lone ranger in some, you know, sublet office space somewhere. Uh, I think, you know, all of those. And then I, I would say that the real, real bottom line is I believe that you can actually engineer successful startups. And so we intend to have a curriculum, but it's not going to be the 43rd guy who teaches, you know, web mobile design. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, you can get, he can teach you that anywhere. Uh, we want to have a curriculum and we want to have some, uh, some real substance around how do you make sure that you are optimizing the startups that are here to be successful. And I call that startup engineering, and that's going to be our secret sauce. That's great. So talk a little bit. One of the questions was about um, maybe people have heard you talk about up or out. Yeah. And just yeah. Some, some desire to have you explain that a little better, help them understand. Listen, I, I think that uh, we do, just as I say to people that we fire at any business, that we're doing uh, them a favor and we're doing uh, our, our company a service, just as we say to all the students at Tribeca Flashpoint, we're not your folks, you know, save the strokes for your folks, we're your first employer. If we bullshit you or tell you that you're the greatest filmmaker in the world and you go out to the real world, we've done you a disservice. So there are some people whose ideas just aren't going to make. They're just not, you know, and, and to help them either pivot or reevaluate or find something else to do, I think that's significant. Uh, the culture that I want here is consistent with having a, community, a tremendously supportive community uh, that's going to turn out and build great businesses. I mean, the bottom line is 
We want to be a place where you can build a successful business, create jobs, help our economy grow, uh, participate in this excitement. And, you know, if you're just phoning it in, uh, you know, there's a lot of other places you can be. Good. Well, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, having done this, that's how the world treats you anyway. So yeah, exactly. There's no, exactly. There are no questions there. So a couple interesting questions. I want to throw you a little bit of a fun curveball here. The top vote getter let, right let now decide. is... My dad is 68 and can't turn his cell phone on. You seem to know everything about tech. Same generation. What's interesting you and your contemporaries who have? Well, you know, I got 11 votes. You know, we um, <laughs> look. We, you know, it, I have to tell you that we're presently and regularly engaged in the development of new technologies because that's what we're interested in. Uh, you know, I didn't think that you could open a digital media college and have the students graduate and be two years behind. We want them to be two years ahead. So uh, we've been, we, and uh, Ed, Ed LaHood is here, who's one of our you know, super technical you know, leads, we've been doing this 30 or 40 years, and it's, you don't stop. I mean, if this is your interest and your passion. Uh, so I, you know, I'm really excited. I mean, we're doing stuff in AR, we're doing stuff in, as I said, mass customization stuff and all kinds of different things. I mean, we're, you know, we've just enabled the Coke bottle for Coca-Cola in some amazing ways to play videos and music. So um, I just think the sky's the limit. Technology is going to infuse everything. Every business is going to go from analog to digital. Uh, I love the ride. I mean, I love the, the whole process. Well, you can tell you're passionate about it. If you've ever been to Howard's office or going to his desk, you know, the first thing is the monitor is about the size of the wall. It's a radiator too, though. You have to understand. And he, uh, he gets that he gets that thing up there, and whatever he's got on the screen is up there, and it's uh, everything is always an interactive experience, which is awesome. So, um, a couple of the questions that I think would be are really interesting and in, in getting a lot of votes. A lot of good voting, by the way. Thank you. So, um, if you had to think of a biggest failure, what would it be, and why, and what did you learn from? You know, I know you want me to answer that question, and I always say facetiously haircuts have been, you know, among, <laughs> among, my, among my biggest Actually, values. Actually, the people voted. I'm right. just reflecting the you know, people here. You know, it's funny, I mean, because, and I wrote about this uh, about a month ago in Inc., that even if you're failing, even if your business idea is not successful, I, I don't even regard these things as failures because I think then you have a different set of obligations. Then you have to do a soft landing, then you have to provide for your employees, then you have to not screw a bunch of creditors, then you have to treat your investors fairly so that you stay in the game and you can do it again. So, you know, even when I've wound down things that haven't met our expectations and things like that, you know, I've never felt it's a failure. And in fact, I always have people come up to me and say, do I remember 25 years ago, I, you know, I help some guy with a mortgage or I, did, I, I don't remember any of that stuff. I mean, the, the real magic of being an entrepreneur is you barely remember yesterday because you're so focused on tomorrow. And so whatever they were, whatever skin knees, whatever embarrassments, whatever mistakes we made, as long as we learn from them and as long as I think we never took advantage of people or treated people poorly or stuff like that, I can't, you know, I don't think it's an issue of failure. I mean, I think it's an, it's an analytical process and you learn from every single thing, every single day. Um, the good news about having done this so often is we're now actively sort of advising guys, for example, uh, Body Shop, you know, bids, Snapsheet, new name. What are they doing? You know, they're working to disrupt the insurance claims industry. All right, this is CCC, right? 40 years later, new technology, same story, same guys running the insurance companies. I mean, frightening. So they said, you know, do you know the, you happen to know somebody at CCC? I'm like, yeah, I happen to know somebody at CCC. So, you know, we can help them. I mean, it's the same model. We literally sent over to them our marketing stuff from 35 years ago, use the same stuff, you know, make it look a little newer and stuff. It's the same story. It's the same set of anxieties, the same set of issues. So that was CCC. ORC was about measuring customer satisfaction. So BCV Evolve, which is a company here that we're invested in, is measuring, you know, luxury hotel customer satisfaction in social media. We've been to this movie. You know, the issue is how do you quantify that stuff? 
We know the answer to that. We had to do it when we were measuring automobile customer satisfaction. We had to figure out how do you quantify something that's this intangible about whether people had a good experience or not. And we did it. We made it up, but we did it, you know. And so uh, we're working with them. So, you know, it's just astonishing the extent to which uh, a lot of these movies we've seen, we, I think we can add tremendous value. And that's why I say when we talk about the process here of reviewing the companies and meeting with the companies, I don't want to have eight random guys sit and be the panel to watch 10 different companies. I want to have like six or seven people in that industry meeting with all the startups we have in that industry. Worst case, they've met the decision makers for the rest of their lives. Best case, those people give them a fair shake, some good information, and some really valuable advice. That's the model. You know, it's right. domain, curated, you know, uh, support and help. I think will make a lot more people successful. I don't think two or three out of ten, which is the venture, a great venture return formulation, that's not acceptable for us. We should do better. Wow. That's good advice and a high, high bar. So um, one of the questions that came up here, a little more personal, but you and I have talked about, and I think it's a really interesting one, is you know, you're famous for your um, work ethic. And you say, nobody would outwork you, and I know that already from the time uh, we've been friends. And even watching you in your, in your neg minus four weeks uh, before you start the, uh, the job here. Um, but you have a wife and daughters. How do you balance life and work? So the story I tell about that is when I was um, uh, first looking for my first law job, I was recruited by Cravath, Swain & Moore, the biggest law firm in the country at the time. And I met the senior partners, and it was a huge bums rush. You're like, you know, you'll have a house in the Hamptons, and you'll do all yeah, this. You had a law review. Yeah. That's the yeah. letter. Yeah, so I would, you know, it was. Uh, and so the best guy that I met said to me that life had these three components, uh, work, recreation, and family. And uh, he said, he actually only had two. He said he, he so loved his work that it was his recreation, and then he made time for family. And that's my split. That's how I do it. You know, it's not magic. Uh, it's great to have daughters that are older than you. Uh, but um, that was Thank that's you, a, I like being right, 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 younger. Right. Good. That's a choice that you make. I uh, work is that important to me, but so is families. And by the way, the third component that is equally important are the people that I work with. This, none of this would happen uh, without having people who are, you know, unbelievably supportive, unbelievably talented, and dedicated. And so, those are the. That's how I allocate my energies and stuff. Not much of a golf game. No, no, <laughs> never, never. I, I was a caddy. I was a caddy. So this is how I got spoiled. You know, caddies get to play on Monday when the course is closed, so I could play nine holes in 36 minutes. Ever since, I, you know, if you, <laughs> I, I, you know, I suffer from something between ADD and hurry sickness. So if you could play golf in 35 minutes, I'd be for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one final question here. Um, you know, you've been a great leader in our community. Now you're leading 1871, and we couldn't be more excited, both as a Chicagoan and someone involved in support of what we're doing here. But as sort of the cornerstone of our tech community here, um, as you think about success, both for 1871 and that being part of catalyzing Chicago to the next next level as a startup hub. What, what, is, what does the future look like to you? What does success look like to you? Well, so I had uh, a non-lunch today with Brian Johnson, uh, which is great because I don't eat lunch. Um, and he had already eaten lunch, so that worked out really well. Um, and Brian Johnson, if you don't know, is the guy who, uh, you know, Braintree was just acquired for been here? 850 million or whatever it was. I think it's. I think if you do the earnout, it's close to a billion. Yeah. So anyway, um, so we had this conversation because I, uh, you know, I asked him what he's doing now. He left Braintree day-to-day -day operations almost two years ago. So he went to Washington and he had a thought about changing and revolutionizing government, and he, after eight or nine months, gave up on that. Uh, and uh, he's now gone to San Francisco, and he's building an innovation hub uh, with, really? a, with a bunch of really smart people to work on AI and a bunch of other things. All right. So, but, you know, Ram has this dream that it's too bad that Braintree didn't buy PayPal, and it's too bad we don't have, like, a multi-billion dollar exit. 
you know, I, I think what was interesting about him is he said he wanted to make a lot of money by the time he was 30, so he made a lot of money by the time he was 34, or whatever it is. And then he said he wanted to do things to change the world. And so, you know, I, I think success in Chicago is a lot of $100 and $200 million businesses that do well, that make a lot of money, maybe they get sold. Um, I'm not, you know, so focused on some gigantic new single business because that's, that's not the model that makes sense for our city. Even. I mean, we have so many of these industries where you could have five and 10 businesses doing 50 or $100 million and growing you know, and being very healthy. And that, that opens the possibility that you can have people going on and doing subsequent things and everything else. So to me, you know, I, I think that the goal is gonna be to uh, see the economy grow, to attack not just what we're doing here at 1871, but I think ed tech and med tech and you know, basically FinTech and uh, this morning Mike and I were talking about travel tech and food tech, you know, Mark Schulman said, why don't we have a food incubator and FemTech, you know, why don't we have a, an incubator for women? I mean, I think all of these are, you know, significant opportunities and there's just so much on our plate that success to me just can, is the continued growth along all these parameters but you know, intelligently enough, you know, plan so that we don't end up a mile wide and an inch deep trying to do uh, too many things and doing a lot of things poorly. That's great. So. Well, thank you for your sure. leadership and thank you for here. being here tonight. It's been Thanks. A lot of fun. Thank you, buddy.